حقيقة Okay, now we are recording. So everything that you say from now on will uh, be used against you in due time. I will speak with caution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you never know what happens in the future, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Might always become a victim of cancel culture later on. <laughs> <laughs> That's Jafus <Jeff's> Kim letters. <laughs> I like your shirt, Ben. <laughs> <There. laughs> it's the only thing I can do right, to revive old memories. <laughs> Are you going this year? No, that would have been too risky. Um, I mean, travel within Europe is now reasonably uh, reliable, but I, I wouldn't have dared to book anything in the US earlier this year. As you know, my brother lives in Switzerland and he's coming to the US because it, he says it's safer to vacation here than in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> There's something to this, I guess. Yeah. Now my first attempt will be in January for the Protein Folding Gordon Europe. Conference. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Hi, Kings. Hi, Ben. Hello, Ken. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all. Hi, Good Joan. Good to see you all, yeah. you, Ken. So even though it's six, I think we give it another minute or two. Yeah. Well, it's actually eight for June. It's, That's uh, correct. <laughs> it's really crazy. <laughs> I was actually surprised that you uh, that you went to grab a glass of water. Uh, I would have needed a coffee at this hour. Yes, I actually didn't have time <laughs> to make one. <laughs> this is my. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I got my coffee after. So. Yeah, right. You deserved it then. Yes, it was my bad timing and waking up too late. So. so this is actually the Santa Barbara beach behind you? It is a Santa Barbara. It's I didn't take the picture, but it is Santa Barbara, yes. Yeah. Martin Moskowitz once told me that when he used to hire new uh, faculty members, he used to take them to a specific point looking at the beach and then start telling them about the greatness of the UC Santa Barbara faculty and, uh, and uh, the place and how wonderful it is. And they always signed after that. Well, yeah, it tricked me as well. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> ah, he hired you. Okay. He did, yes. Um, he takes you to the pier. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And so you how is he doing these that? days? Oh, I'll tell you after, unrecorded. Okay. Okay. So it looks like the numbers have stabilized, huh? Yeah, I, I think we can, I think we can start. Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to again see so many of you joining our webinar on protein folding and dynamics. I checked online and it turns out that this is the 30th webinar that we have in this series. So uh, in this respect, it's a, it's a little jubilee. And of course, we are all happy and also a little bit proud that you, that you keep joining us. And um, so thanks for that. And um, so uh, today it's my particular pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Joan Amache. Um, thanks a lot, Joan, for, for joining us today uh, at this early hour for you in California. Um, a few words about Joan, and I think many of you will, will already um, be very familiar with her work and also with her. Um, Joan, of course, is an absolute um, expert 
in developing and uh, virtues also in, in applying techniques of statistical uh, and computational physics to study biological problems. And these problems actually range from uh, protein folding reactions and uh, protein aggregation um, up to phase separation of proteins and other cellular processes. And I think apart from addressing very fundamental problems in protein folding, such as the kinetics of heat cold transitions, frustrations in uh, folding energy landscape, a hallmark of Jones' work has always been and still is, I think, the enormous complexity of the systems that she's studying and the problems that she is addressing. For example, she used simulations and computational models to understand how confinement and chaperonins but also molecular crowding inside cells uh, affect stability of proteins and also kinetics of protein folding reactions. For example, the question of uh, whether GROAL, the chaperone, in boost yields by accelerating folding reactions or just by preventing aggregation is still, is still a very, um, um, very important question that would still lead, I think, to heated discussions in the field today. Now, more recently, so in the past uh, 10 years, she went on to study the mechanisms also of multimolecular assemblies, such as uh, uh, fibrillization of, uh, of proteins, uh, and we will hear about this today, but also liquid-liquid phase separation, which uh, uh, I think we will, uh, she will also touch today. And uh, before I hand over the stage to Joan, I would like just to uh, say a few words about her CV. So Joan received her PhD from MIT and then became a postdoc. Um, and I think it was a joint postdoc uh, with Charlie Brooks um, and uh, Jose Onochik. And after the postdoc, she started her own group at the University of Chicago in 2000, but already a year later, she moved over to uh, uh, California, to, to the University of California, Santa Barbara. And um, I guess um, maybe the weather in California might have been a factor for, uh, in, in this decision. Of course, given all her seminal contributions, Joan received many awards and honors, among them the NSF Career Award, the Packard Award, the Alfred Sloan Fellowship, and many more. She's also the editor-in-chief um, of the Journal of Physical uh, Chemistry. And um, I just read that uh, she is the first female editor in 124 years um, of uh, existence of this journal, which is quite something. So today, Joan will talk about her latest news on the aggregation and phase separation of the tau protein. But before I really hand over the virtual stage to, to Joan, um, I would like to ask each of you to mute your microphones such that we can listen to Joan. As always, for the newcomers who have never been in this webinar, we will have a question and answer session right after the talk. And um, if you have a question, just use the chat window, type in the word question, and I will call you one by one um, after the talk, and you can ask your question in person. Um, I also have to mention that uh, to avoid Zoom bombing, we will lock the webinar five minutes after start. So in case you get kicked out for some reason, um, you will have a hard time entering. So please use our YouTube uh, live stream to, to follow the talk in real time. Um, in case you missed the talk, of course, uh, watch the YouTube recording afterwards. Um, and finally, I would like to mention our next speaker in this series. Um, in two weeks from now, we're going to have Rui Papu. We'll talk about the link between charges in intrinsically disordered proteins and uh, phase separation. And with this, um, I'm really done now. And um, I uh, stop sharing my screen and head over the stage to Joan. So Joan, thanks a lot for being here today with us. And um, we are very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was one of the people who had a conflict at 8 a.m. because of school for my kids, and I really took advantage of the YouTube um, posting, so thank you all for doing that. So I will maneuver to my um, laser pointer. So I'm going to talk to you about um, work in my group that focuses on using simulations to probe a number of biomolecular uh, systems. And in particular, I will focus on the self-assembly of intrinsically disordered proteins with an emphasis on liquid-liquid phase separation. And I work with a number of experimental collaborators and I'll be showcasing their work. Um, and also to emphasize how 
simulation and experiment together can really yield much more interesting results sometimes than on their own. So what I'm showing you on this cover graph is on the left hand side, an experimental microscopy of um, droplets form through the self-assembly of the tau protein. And on the right hand side are simulations of an analogous system. I just have to get my laser pointer going. I'm having a slow transition. So um, for this audience and based on all of the talks I've seen, I don't really need to go over what an intrinsically disordered protein is. So I'm gonna just show a few slides um, for the purposes relevant for my talk. And I'll refer you to Robert Best's recent talk if you wanna hear all about um, details of IDPs. The main point for um, my lecture is that intrinsically disordered proteins, as their name indicates, do not have a stable globular fold. These proteins coexist uh, between a range of uh, conformations, primarily extended conformations, although some secondary structure and some compactness can happen. The conformations are governed by the amino acid sequence. And as a general rule, IDPs have a higher net charge and a lower number of hydrophobic residues than globular proteins. And this explains why they're extended and why they don't pack their hydrophobic core because they don't really have a well-defined hydrophobic core. An important factor in this talk and in the life of IDPs is that they live in an incredibly crowded environment. And in a crowded environment, you're increasing rates of intermolecular interactions. So you can favor processes like aggregation or a liquid-liquid phase separation. Crowding can also impact the ability of proteins to adopt conformations or interact with partners. And the final item I want to mention about IDPs is that there, we, we often focus on IDPs in terms of disease. But IDPs are functional entities in the body, and so they have very specific roles. Um, they often need to bind to a partner molecule in order to function, but they play roles in cell signaling, um, building materials in the body, a host of very important roles. However, there is pathology involved and it is often caused by this crowded environment um, that favors the polymerization of these intrinsically disordered peptides into large scale aggregate structures. And I'm showing here um, fibrils that are seen in Alzheimer's disease, type two diabetes, Parkinson's disease. I will talk about one disease related uh, protein, which is tau, but I'm not gonna focus on this aggregation process. I'm gonna focus on another assembly, which is um, liquid liquid phase separation. So this schematic here is showing the diversity of conformations and assemblies that IDPs can adopt. You can be soluble, you can be in an amyloid phase, I'm gonna call this a solid phase because you're locked in with these strong um, hydrogen bonds and uh, often side chain interactions. But you can also adopt another state, which is a liquid state. So this um, assembly has numerous names. Um, I will use them interchangeably. Um, Coacervation strictly um, should be used for polyelectrolytes, but we use it in biology as well. Uh, it's also called liquid-liquid phase separation, droplets, biomolecular condensates. And the idea here is that you have a phase separation um, between a protein dense, which is shown here, and a protein depleted phase. Now, there's a lot of questions about what this state does and why it exists. Uh, is it a state that's active or is it a state that's a precursor to these amyloid fibrils? There's evidence 
for the tau protein I'm going to talk about that this droplet can be stable. But in cases where there are mutations, it can transition to a gel phase. And this gel phase can then transition to amyloid fibrils. So it is possibly a precursor to uh, fibril formation. Um, where do these liquid liquid droplets exist? Are they real? Yes, they're not just uh, lab constructs. Um, here's a picture of a cell and you're all familiar with the membrane bound organelles, um, but you also have membrane less organelles, which are assemblies that are not enclosed in a membrane. And these are stress granules, for instance, or cow bodies. And these are coarserates. They're liquid, liquid phase separated states. Um, and you'll note that they're not always just a protein. They're often a protein with a nucleic acid. And I'll address both um, self coacervation which is a protein that can phase separate on its own, and complex coacervation where you need a partner molecule uh, for assembly to happen. Now, I was talking to my hosts uh, before the recording started and we're talking about Santa Barbara and the ocean. And so in Santa Barbara, uh, much of the research does focus around the ocean. So I wanna show you an example uh, of liquid liquid phase separation um, that's related to animals that live by Santa Barbara, which are mussels. So mussels are organisms that many people eat, um, but in Santa Barbara, people are more irritated by them because they actually stick to absolutely everything. They stick to boat hulls, they stick to the pier, um, and they're considered mostly a nuisance. But you can see a picture here, which is from Santa Barbara, where waves are pounding. And these mussels are just stuck there. Uh, and the reason they're stuck there is because they have uh, an adhesive protein that gets extruded under the foot. And you can see this little schematic here of a liquid liquid droplet. So what the uh, animal does is it produces a coacervate of these droplets under the foot. And at the right moment, it spreads the droplet uh, onto the surface. So this is, um, functional role of coacervation. So our interest was in ex examining the adhesion of um, the muscle foot proteins to uh, various surfaces and also understand the process of coacervation. So I'll show you this application first and then uh, I will move on to the tau protein that is the title of my talk. But I want to show a second example also in Santa Barbara and this is a sandcastle worm. And what this worm does is it takes pieces of sand and broken fragments of seashells, and it produces its own um, peptide that forms coacervate that just uh, like in uh, the muscle foot protein acts as a glue. So the tubes that you see here are the homes of the sandcastle worm uh, that are held together by this adhesive glue. And what's quite interesting is that the sequence of the sandcastle worm has some similarities with those of the muscle foot protein. Um, and I will talk about sequence uh, characteristics in a few slides. So I will talk about first adhesion uh, of these IDPs, and then I'll talk about liquid-liquid phase separations with an emphasis on the methodology that we use. So here is UC Santa Barbara, and there is the beach, and there live uh, these muscles I was talking to you about, the Mitchellus Californias. And as I mentioned, they stick because they have um, adhesive proteins that are extruded under the threads uh, of the animal. And so this is your muscle and this is your rock and you can see it's sticking there. And so here's my collaborator, Herb Waite uh, at UCSB who discovered all of these muscle foot proteins and he labeled them um, with numbers. 
And so the two that are gonna be relevant for my talk are muscle protein three and five. These are the ones that are involved in binding. Other muscle foot proteins have other roles, um, but not relevant here. So here's the sequence. And uh, for the IDP experts in the field, you can see that this is a sequence that probably would not fold to a globular protein. It's highly enriched in charge residues, lysines, arginines. Um, it has a number of glycines and part flexibility. And it also has these unusual amino acids, which are DOPAs. So uh, DOPA is a post-translationally modified tyrosine. And in the two sequences I'm gonna be talking about, three and five, you see the Ys are the DOPAs. So it is uh, an unusual um, transformation that it seems to be retained in all of these marine organisms that stick to various surfaces. We considered uh, with the goal of biologically um, inspired materials, a synthetic construct of MSP3. So this peptide uh, has all the elements of the full length peptide, but it's computationally more tractable and experimentally easier to synthesize. So it has lysines, it has most importantly the dopas and the glycines. So we performed uh, replica exchange molecular dynamic simulations. Um, and this number should be uh, enhanced. It's actually up to 500 nanoseconds per replica. And um, what we were trying to do was characterize the confirmation sampled by the system. So the, I'm gonna have to get rid of my pointer for a second. All right, so the way you do replica exchange is you first equilibrate a system and then you perform identical copies of your system and run simulations, periodically swapping confirmations. And the point here is to escape low lying traps. Uh, if you just run a simulation at a given temperature, it's gonna get locked in a state. Um, the outcome of a simulation, which is important here, is just a series of structures at a given temperature. And we can then take these structures and um, do an analysis, get free energy surfaces, et cetera. So for this particular peptide, what we get is a series of uh, confirmations, some extended, some collapsed. Uh, the important point to take away here is that there is not one confirmation. So a globular protein would fold, let's say 9% to a folded structure. Here we have 3%, 3%. So you have interconverting structures. And that is maybe key to the ability of these proteins to perform a variety of functions because they can readily change conformations and adapt to, in this case, a surface or in the cell, maybe another protein that they would bind to. So we looked at MFP with um, various surfaces. I'll show you first organic thin films, which were meant to be a mimic of slimy rocks in Santa Barbara. So we did this work in collaboration uh, with an experimental group. It was started uh, with the late Jacob Israelachvili and then continued by um, his students who um, continue to work in this group. So experimentally, we looked at replica exchange molecular dynamic simulations and experimentally they use a surface force apparatus, which is an approach in which you have two surfaces and you lower one surface and then you pull up on your thin film of a peptides. And what that allows you to do is assess how sticky these peptides are, how much force you need to pull a peptide off the surface. And we considered hydrophobic and hydrophilic surfaces, CH3 and OH um, covered self-assembled monolayers. So here's just an experimental um, trace. Um, 
the conclusion from experiment is that adhesion, and let me get back my PowerPoint, sorry, my laser, um, the adhesion energy is much stronger on hydrophobic than hydrophilic surfaces. To try to get experiment, a computational insight, we perform umbrella sampling simulations where we pulled on our peptide off the surface. We get qualitatively the same trends that it, the peptide is much stickier on hydrophobic surfaces. And um, it's not exact compared to experiment because we have a slightly different setup. We're pulling one peptide, they're pulling a thin film. Uh, in addition, there's all this force field um, issues in these um, simulations. But qualitatively, we also see adhesion to hydrophobic surfaces. So what we can do with simulations to assist experimental interpretation is actually look at conformations. So I'm showing snapshots of hydrophobic and hydrophilic um, entities. And if we zoom in, you can see that the hydrophobic entities are splatted out on the surface, whereas the hydrophilic entities are beaded up. The hydrophilic groups have much more contact with the surface. Um, and I will come back to details of this in a second, but you can see that the hydrophobic um, surface contacts with the face of the dopa, which is shown here. Whereas in the hydrophilic case, it's interacting with the um, OH group. Now, the thing that was a little surprising here is that DOPA did not play the role that we anticipated. So DOPA is involved in both of these. And remember, DOPA is that unique amino acid that we thought might govern adhesion. Um, the way it's oriented on the hydrophobic surface would be the same for phenylalanine or tyrosine. In the hydrophilic case, it can only interact with 1OH, so it's really just acting like a tyrosine. So what we did was a computational experiment where we uh, mutated tyrosine, I mean, DOPA to tyrosine, redid the same experiments and simulations, and indeed found that DOPA and tyrosine were not significantly different. The binding modes were the same. So this puzzled us a little bit because we truly had believed that DOPA was responsible for adhesion. And this showed us that the picture was a little bit more complicated. Now, there is one little quirk with um, DOPA is that it actually has an ideal um, structure to bind to certain surfaces, but not specifically to one we were looking at. So I'm, gonna, I'm showing this here. If we look at the hydrophobic SAM, the DOPA is interacting with the ring. And in a tyrosine, it has, or the DOPA, it's just 1OH. But if I direct your attention to the upper surface, you'll see that on mica, there is ideal position in the, of the oxygens to enable bidentate uh, bonding. And this bidentate bonding provides increased interactions and now distinguishes between a DOPA, a tyrosine and a phenylalanine because this type of binding is only possible for DOPA. So I'm gonna turn my attention now over the last couple of years, we focused primarily on mica and we're looking now at titanium oxide as another interesting uh, material to understand the mechanism of um, muscle foot protein binding. So um, let me show you now some results on mica. And here again, we're looking at a DOPA variant and a tyrosine variant. And again, mica has our hope that we will see this bidentate binding. So here's the experimental results. And this time it worked. Uh, the binding on mica was much uh, stronger with DOPA than with um, tyrosine. And if we go to our simulations, we can now clearly see the ability of the 
muscle foot protein to form these bidentate bonds. But we did not see as much DOPA binding as maybe we had anticipated. And the other thing that we noted is that there were only three amino acids that interacted with the surface and they act, interact in a certain order. So we first saw lysine interacting and sometimes glycine, but primarily lysine interacting with the surface. And subsequently we saw DOPA binding. And we looked at a few other sequences I'm not showing you uh, here, but we invariably found that lysine and DOPA were key binding elements. And glycine seemed to be an essential element uh, in order for the uh, peptide to be flexible enough to bind to surfaces. So then we thought we were very clever and that we would design a minimal peptide that only has lysine, glycine, and DOPA and use that as a core element for binding. But of course, nature is much more clever than we are and has already thought of that. So if you continue down the beach, you find another variant, which is a septifer uh, muscle. And look at the sequence. I mean, it's exactly that. It's a series of Y, G, K repeats. So this um, protein has the three elements that we had identified as critical for binding. It has some other things, but, but really it has these three repeats. So we then decided to move on with this construct to look at peptides. And then later I'll show you peptoids um, based on this construct with the idea of designing um, very adhesive uh, sequences. So with this small sequence in hand, we were first interested in seeing what kind of arrangements of uh, amino acids would lead to the greatest adhesion. So I'll show you um, one assembly that we looked at, which was that we had glycines in the middle. Then we had our two charge groups, which again are the ones that we believe bind first to the surface. And then we had X, which could be DOPA, tyrosine, or phenylalanine. So these are PMFs. The deeper the well, the stronger the binding. So uh, I will show you first DOPA, which is the blue trace. So again, you see that you have the binding of the lysines, and then you have the possibility of forming this bidentate bond. For phenylalanine, which is the one in black here, what you see is the lysines bind, but there's really no interaction with the phenylalanine ring itself. So in essence, you have fewer abilities and contacts uh, to, to bind. So we're continuing this vein, uh, looking at other permutations uh, to see what the ideal uh, sequence would be for an adhesive protein. But one thing that the glycine made us think of is that it's really important to have flexibility. And the other thing is we don't necessarily want these uh, peptoids to interact too much. Uh, how can we make something that is even more flexible and might bind even better? So we started thinking about peptoids as an alternative to peptides. So peptoids are shown here at the bottom. And um, what you see is that we've moved the side chain to the nitrogen over here. So you have la lack of a loss of chirality, you have a loss of backbone hydrogen bonds, and you have importantly new conformational freedom. So these could be your, your new IDPs, extra IDPs. Um, and um, we looked at, again, a uh, construct based on a muscle foot protein, and we focused on the segment of muscle foot protein that also had just this repeat of uh, G, K, and Ys. And the construct that our experimental collaborator came up with was this one. We're looking at others right now. This one just appeared to be easier to synthesize. So it has... Um, essentially just a glycine, lysine, and X would denote phenylalanine, tyrosine, or DOPA, 
And so we have different sequences that unique, we haven't mixed them, that have uniquely phenylalanine, alanine, tyrosine, and dopa. And we're gonna look at the surface mica. So here's the experimental results. And what we find is um, dopa is, and I think this is now expected because we're looking at mica, the most adhesive um, of the peptides. Um, if we look at our simulation results, we can see, um, again, a difference in binding in the sense that lysines can interact in all cases, but only dopa forms in the case of um, the dopa-rich sequence. So here's a little cartoon to show weak adhesion and strong adhesion. And um, here's an example where cartoons look just as good as simulations because this is exactly what we see in simulations that we have the ability to form um, interactions with the dopa entity in the case of um, um, the dopa peptide, but not in the case of lysine. So we're continuing in this direction uh, seeking to make the best adhesive peptides that we can based on uh, knowledge gained from simulation experiment. Now, where does this tie into um, droplets and coacervates? Well, it does because these very same peptides are capable of forming liquid-liquid phase separation. And we are working on um, simulations of these systems but you can see that the sequences are quite, for us, complicated. And with simulations, we run into a problem of atomistic simulations requiring an enormous amount of computational resources. So the simulations I've shown you so far have all been atomistic simulations, which means that I have my protein in water. Uh, but I've also only shown you one. Um, and we have simulations where we have a few. Um, but to look at liquid-liquid phase separation, we need to look at hundreds and hundreds of uh, proteins. So what I'm going to do is turn to a coarse-grained approach. And I'm going to distinguish between two types of coacervations, uh, simple and complex. Simple would be a peptide that can form droplets on its own. And complex would be where you need a partner molecule to form these droplets. So let me start with the simplest case where you just have a polypeptide and it can form droplets. So there are numerous questions that we're trying to answer. Uh, we're looking at questions of charge patterning that can dictate whether or not you phase separate um, charge density and short range interactions. And I was really hoping to show you some of our recent work where we've incorporated hydrophobic uh, beads into our um, construct. And we have it all working, except that we're at the stage now where the simulations need to converge. So um, maybe I can come back next year. But let me just show you what actually works, which is charge uh, patterning. So we used a mall system um, that was first designed by Rohit Papu, who will be talking next week. And it's a very nice system because it only has two um, features to it, positive and negative charges. So we have used this model system. Um, there's also some very nice analytical work by Rohit Papu, who's used this system as well to look at uh, phase separation. So what we've done with this system is we've asked a question, how does charge distribution affect uh, self-assembly. Um, does it matter if we scatter charges throughout our sequence, or do we really need to have a certain distribution for the peptide to self-assemble? Uh, so we're going to use two models here. Um, we're going to use a coarse grain model, which means that we are taking away water and we're presenting it implicitly and we're also going to represent each amino acid by a bead. And in the first model I'm going to show you here, it just has a positive and a negative bead. And it's the simplest model you can use, which is a, a Gaussian chain. The reason we use this extremely simple model 
there are better ones out there, but we're using this one because we want to map this system onto a field theory. And if we use this system, we can go back and forth between the two and compare our results. So we have uh, a system with n sites per bead, a certain segment length between beads and charges on the beads. And this is what I'm gonna call a particle-based MD simulation. So our three terms to pay attention to are bond potential to keep us together, an excluded volume term, which is uh, quite important uh, for phase separation and an electrostatic potential. This is great at low polymer density. And we're collaborating now with uh, Jitain Mittal, who has this uh, slab methodology. And he's taking our model and doing um, the uh, formation of droplets within the system that we're then going to be able to compare to our field theory simulations. And again, because we're going to map this onto our field theory simulations, we can have exact comparison. So as I said, this works well for low polymer. But if we want to have really thousands and thousands and get a very nice phase diagram, it's necessary to simplify even further. So this is work uh, that's done by a joint student, Said and Nafaji, who is working with me and Glenn Fredrickson. And Glenn has really pioneered this field theory uh, simulation. The strength of this method is that you're looking at a polymer in the field of other polymers. So you're really only looking at a single uh, polymer partition function. So the idea here is that we look at this uh, polymer in fluctuating fields, and uh, we're looking at a chemical potential field, an electrostatic field, and here's our key, which is a single chain partition function. So this turns out to be a very effective method that allows us to uh, look at um, phase separation. Um, I will have two slightly different notations in my talk because I have um, two different uh, phase diagrams, but there are two analogous quantities. This is the concentration. This is excluded volume, B, and E is the electrostatic. So we can solve this with complex Langevin equations of motion. And let me show you now both particle-based and um, field theory results. So in our particle-based simulations, we're looking at conformations. So what I'm showing you here is the race of gyration, so how compact your structure is, as a function of blockiness. And so for blockiness, we have two different parameters I'm listing at the right. Uh, a charge decoration and kappa parameter. They're different, but they both give you a measure of blockiness. So I'm gonna stick with kappa because it's just a little easier to read. A kappa of one would be your perfect block copolymer. And what you see is that this perfect block is compact, whereas the more dispersed charges lead to more extended conformations. So the reason we're interested in this is because we want to look at assemblies and we want to understand how monomer conformation affects assemblies. So I'm going to focus here on the single chain of a die block and show you our simulations where we're looking at uh, many of them together. So as I mentioned, this one is not converged, but G10, and because we're using just running it, but GT Metal is taking the system right now and using his slab methodology, and he's getting uh, much nicer results uh, that we hope to publish soon. Um, but the point that I want to make, even with these unconverged simulations, is that you can start seeing the beginning of phase separation. And the interesting thing is that the interactions that govern collapse of a single chain, uh, which are the plus and minus coming together are also the interaction that govern larger scale assemblies. So the dark and the light represent two different chains and you can see the red and the blue coming together between partnering chains. So with this, we can get almost atomistic insight. 
But where we'd like to go is to um, a field theory model. And let me get rid of my count pointer once again, where we can get phase diagrams. And now my color scheme here is a little bit different. Uh, red means protein dense and blue means protein depleted. So here you just see things wiggling around here very rapidly, you see the formation of these liquid droplets happening in this field theory method. Sampling with this field theory method is efficient. So we can um, now get to a phase diagram. And so we have more than one method to get a phase diagram, but I'll show you the one I think that makes more, most intuitive sense, which is uh, doing simulations over and over again at different conditions of electrostatic and extruded volume and finding conditions of chemical and mechanical equilibrium because that's where your phases will coexist. And again, we're trying to fi find the boundaries of our phase diagram. So we identify uh, conditions where you have mechanical equilibrium um, coexistence, and then we run our simulations uh, at, um, oh, sorry, I have something popped up. Uh, we run our simulations and we identify um, the regions that are protein rich and protein depleted. So that's what I'm showing with the circles here. Um, so the line here corresponds to your conditions um, of equilibrium. So the circles I'm gonna show here, which are again, our phase boundaries, I'm gonna show you again on the next slide. So these circles correspond to the boundaries of our um, phase diagram. So the way to read this is, and I'm gonna play the movies, I'm gonna have to use my pointer because I can't do uh, the laser pointer with the movies, but uh, the larger the envelope that I'm tracing here with my pointer, the larger the ability to phase separate. So what you see is that the blockiest of sequences is the one that is most capable of phase separation. And so the phase separation is inside this window as shown by the movie here. Outside, you have no phase separation. So we can learn a lot of things from these sequences. Uh, we can learn that uh, blockiness favors phase separation. We can learn that, for instance, a green one where you have a very scrambled sequence does not phase separate readily. And we can continue with this exercise uh, on and on and learn all kinds of things. What happens when you increase salt? What happens when you play with the excluded volume? What happens when you play with temperature? But what I'd like to do is move on to um, something that's actually real, which is the tau protein. So for the last year, we've really focused on trying to make connections with experiments. And I don't think I need to give you too much about tau because Liz Rhodes gave a talk last week um, with a lot of insight into tau. So I'm gonna focus on, again, just what you need to know for this talk, which is that tau is a protein that lives inside your neuron. And it has a very important role, which is that it stabilizes microtubules. So tau can come in and it can bind to a microtubule and stabilize it. Microtubules are necessary because they are the tract that allows the transport of neurotransmitters from one end of the neuron to the other. And then these uh, neurotransmitters are released to perform function, you know, connections between synapses. All right, so again, that's your functional role, but there are cases where tau falls off the neuro uh, the microtubule, and this could be because of mutation, it could be because of an environmental condition, but that's actually your disease. So there's your functional and pathological roles. Now, in the last few years, we found out that tau can do much more than that. It can actually also form liquid droplets. Let me just pause for a second to show you the sequence of tau um, and tell you which regions we care about. So most people focus on this region, which is a repeat region, because that's the region that forms amyloid fibrils. We know that this region is so aggregation prone 
that you can cut out small segments of it and you can form amyloids. I'm gonna focus on this region and also on the proline rich region, which is not known to aggregate, but I will show you uh, plays a role in liquid liquid phase separation. So altogether, these form the microtubule binding domain. So um, by this point, everybody knows that if you throw heparin onto tau, it more makes fibrils. And that's what's shown here. This is a trace where you have thioflavin T. So if you take tau, you put heparin, it forms fibrils. But what Song Yihan at UCSB showed, which was um, quite interesting, is that if instead of heparin, you use RNA, which is quite abundant in the cell, you form not amyloid fibrils, but these liquid droplets. And so here we're back to this picture where we have tau, this intrinsically disordered peptide that can be soluble, form amyloids, or form droplets. And tau is interesting because in some cases, this um, state appears to be quite stable, but in mutants, especially when you change the charges, and remember in my previous section, I said charges are very important for uh, liquid liquid phase separation. You change charges, you can actually cause this thing to form a gel and then transition to amyloid fibrils. So there's a rich diversity of behavior for tau. The other reason I showed you the tau sequence slides to show you that it's an immense um, sequence. It's a very long system for us. So it's very, very suitable for these field theoretic methods. So we use the same approach um, as we did before to simulate the system. I just wanna show this slide because I, I keep calling them liquids and I wanna show you that they truly are liquids. So if you look at the bottom here, you can see two droplets that are merging together. So clearly a liquid-like uh, behavior. So these droplets can coalesce and grow. So in Songi's experiment, she can heat the system up and she can cool it down and it reversibly forms droplets. And here's a, just a schematic to show you everything that tau can do. And I'm gonna focus right now on its ability to form these liquid droplets. So the model again that we're using is um, this coarse grain model for tau that we then transform into a field theory model. Tau is a nice system because it has um, a rather simplistic sequence that we can simplify to plus minus and neutral. We have another one running right now that's a little bit more sophisticated, but you'll see even with a simple representation, we can get many of the elements of uh, assembly. So here's the phase diagram. Um, as a function of temperature and concentration of tau. The red circles are experimental results. So these are the experimentally determined uh, boundaries of the phase diagram. The green squares are our results. The magnificent agreement between experiment and theory is uh, not because the model itself is so fantastic, but because in this case, we used experiment to uh, select the parameters for our phase diagram. However, we have predictive abilities because what you can see on the right hand side is our ability to close the phase diagram. Experimentally, they were not able to access this region of uh, space, but uh, with simulations, we can delineate the boundaries. So you can see here this blob, which is um, the formation of a droplet occurring inside this window, whereas outside of the boundary, experimentally and computationally, we cannot see the formation of these droplets. So then we became a little bit ambitious and we decided to make predictions. So um, often it's easier to, to uh, run various conditions uh, computationally than uh, experimentally. So we started just looking at concentration, temperature, um, adding crowders. Crowders is interesting because in a cell you're quite crowded. So we would expect um, 
other molecules in the cell to facilitate or hinder um, a self assembly. So we started working with um, uh, Ken Kosick, who's a neuroscientist, and we first looked at cell culture. So this is a medium in which cells live. In this particular case, I'm gonna be showing you tau assembly in the medium, so not inside the cell. The cells will come in the next slide. So we predicted that increasing concentration would lead to increased phase separation. It's kind of obvious, but it, it does work. Um, we also predicted increase in temperature. And the thing that's of note here is that the temperature where this phase separation happened quite readily was uh, body temperature, meaning that perhaps this happens in the cell. And I should say that when we did this last year, there were no cell experiments. So we did not know whether or not tau actually was able to uh, phase separate in the cell, but this gave us some comfort that it might be possible. Um, Crowders as well. But let me get now to the final part. I um, see the time is running out and I really wanna show you some very recent work where we've been able to look at um, phase separation in the cell while well, we are collaborators. Um, all right, so as I said, we got ambitious because we could make all of these predictions and most of them seem to work. So we were interested in this proline rich domain. Um, Liz spoke a little bit about this domain because she found um, in her research that this proline rich domain that's often neglected may be important for binding to the microtubule, more important in this repeat domain. We were interested in this proline rich domain as well because it's a region where there's a host of sites that can be phosphorylated. And as I said, in the EK peptide, we're really interested in charge and charge distribution and how that affects uh, the ability to phase separate. So what we did computationally is we took this segment, the proline rich domain, which is a red one, and we said, well, can it even phase separate? And according to simulations, it did. So we then bullied our uh, experimental collaborators into making this construct. And sure enough, they saw that it was able to phase separate. So then we decided to go to the cell. And Ken Kosick, um, by combining um, this proline rich domain to an optogenetic um, system um, protein was able to actually see, and that's what's shown by the arrows here, the assembly of tau inside neurons. So now we know that tau can form droplets inside neurons. We still don't know what the role is, but considering that the proline rich domain is known to bind to microtubules, it's plausible that what these droplets do is they concentrate tau and bring them to the neighborhood of um, the microtubule and thereby facilitate binding. And this actually has been suggested recently uh, by a number of other research groups as well. So um, where we're going with this now, I'm gonna wrap up. We're enhancing our um, field theory model by incorporating hydrophobic groups. And we're also trying to incorporate explicit water. What we've learned from uh, the simulations in the experiment is that water and dehydration can play, of course, critical roles in the formation of these droplets. So these are areas that we're continuing to investigate. And uh, the students who did the work um, were James and Said, who is absent, unfortunately, because I took the wrong slide. Uh, and both of them, uh, along with uh, Zach, did the majority of the work that I presented. Um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Joan. That uh, was a terrific talk. Um, and there are already um, a number of questions in the chat. Oh. So, um, uh do you hear me, Joe? Do you hear me, Joe? Yes, yes. Sorry, I was. I had lost. I had lost a chat window. All right. No, no, no. I'm. I'm. I'm calling people up, and then they oh, will. Oh, okay. Questions. Okay. So you don't okay. have to read it. So. Um, okay. So first question is by Sam Safram. Sam, 
Are you still in? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm just starting my video. Uh, well, I, I enjoyed the talk, particularly the more mesoscale aspects that are within my experience. And I just wanted to make a small comment. Uh, mm -hmm. You show in the middle part of the talk where you discuss the phase separation, you uh, showed uh, the, the protein as having plus and minus charges that would, of course, have show Coulomb attraction and, and screened by the salt, which you, didn't, which you didn't discuss in detail, but I'm sure uh, is in the detailed model. I just wanted to comment that in other macromolecular type systems, uh, and uh, one of them was investigated by Cyrus Safinia at Santa Barbara, the attraction in a macromolecule of its plus and minus segments is not always the naive direct Coulomb interaction, but can be due to the release of screening counter ions of the pluses and of the minuses to the rest of the solution. Those counter ions get entropy, and then the plus and minuses start to attract each other. So it's not sort of like a capacitor in a vacuum, but it's a little bit more complicated, and it's not a numerical result, but it really leads to a longer range attraction of the pluses and minuses than you might think because the screening counter ions can be released once the pluses and minuses start to get close to each other. And you can ask Phil Pincus about this and Cyrus Safinia. And here at Weitzman, Jacob Klein did experiments on mica surfaces with oppositely charged, uh, opposite charges. So this might be a very small detail in the scheme no, no. of things, but I just wanted to it's actually a very insightful detail because I think you've picked up something that I did not emphasize here, which is if you, can you still see my screen? Yeah. If, if you look here, we have these tie lines and what you see is that they're pretty much level. So in this particular model, we don't see counter ion release as really a dominant force, but there are plenty of experiments that indeed show that it's something that we should take into account. And that's something that we're investigating here. It may be a limitation of the, it may be, it may be because of, uh, let's say in the black one, the perfect blockiness of the sequence or the perfect balance, or it may simply be a limitation of the mole that we're not correctly accounting for counter iron release. Because, well, in, yeah. in the stuff that we've done, it gives a different spatial dependence of the attraction, depending on the separation of the plus minuses and you would expect from screen, screen Coulomb, it's longer range. Yeah, so that's something, yeah, this, it is, it is a, a something puzzling here that it's something we, we should go back to. Thank you, that's a great comment. Thanks. Okay, so the next question is by David Nesbitt. David. Yeah, Joan, first of all, thank you. Uh, really, the lovely work uh, and very insightful. I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, go back to the tau protein crowding studies. Uh, it, it, you were sort of rushed at the end, and uh, but I know that you, you, you flashed by and that apparently your crowders that you were using were peg crowders. Yes. Uh, and I, I'd be interested in knowing whether or not you saw, uh, I mean, PEG obviously is sort of a, a quite a non-ionic crowder, uh, whether or not you saw, you know, what sizes of PEG you were looking at, yeah. you know, and whether or not you think that uh, crowders that might have more uh, sort of ionic contributions might, might behave differently. Yes, that's, in fact, I'm seeing if I can find my uh, backup slide. Am I allowed to bring up a backup slide to answer that question? Yes, well, as far as I'm concerned, oh. absolutely. I'm giving you that opportunity. Okay. <laughs> you can bring up any slide, Joan. Okay, <laughs> well, it's, and for, yes, actually, because I wasn't, I wasn't going to talk about PEG so much because um, we have just some very preliminary results. But since you asked so nicely, I will reshare it and show you some of our, our, our results. So basically, oh, so this is, these, these are all future work, but let me show you PEG because it's kind of interesting. Um, let's see if I can share again now. So what, what, what size pegs are we talking about? So these, 
uh, let me let me just find this. Okay. This is not, is it sharing? Yes, I'm seeing Okay, it. so um, exactly what we're doing is with the simulations and with the experiment is, is trying to figure out how um, poly electrolytes, uh, this, so this is, we're just looking at poly electrolyte here, uh, are influenced by, by crowding. And um, what we've done so far and with experiment has been an extremely long um, peg. But what we would like to do is exactly what you're saying is look at smaller segments of PEG. Um, and now, of course, when I'm improvising, I don't know if I have my correct um, drawings here. Okay, so here's, here's one. So this is an example with experiment um, where you can see um, two systems I haven't talked about. Um, it's hyaluronic acid. Um, with uh, two polymers. So it's again, a plus minus system. And what they found is that when they added PEG, you can see here formation of droplets. Mm -hmm. In our simulations, we tried to ascertain whether PEG entered the droplets or not. When we look at very, very long PEGs, we find that the density um, for PEG is in the dilute phase. So we don't have any PEG within the droplets. However, it's plausible or possible that if we had much smaller PEGs or if we had um, PEGs that had weird shapes, you have PEGs that have arms sticking out. Uh, yeah. That could change everything. It's, 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 they could maybe even go inside the droplet um, or they could change a mechanism. In our case, it just seems to be some kind of big excluded volume effect. That's basically what we see for these long pegs. So, so John, the, there's <laughs> actually some evidence you've, uh, coming out that there's a strong size dependence to crowding. Uh, so I think that yeah. might be quite interesting for you to look at, uh, at shorter versions and see if, if uh, protein crowding effects might really be strongly size dependent uh, it's worth looking absolutely. at. Yeah, absolutely. And there's also uh, Michael Feig and, and several people also looked at yeah, protein crowders as opposed to these synthetic crowders. And when you have synthetic crowders, it is mostly an excluded volume, but when you have proteins, they can interact. And so if we had in the cell, you would actually have protein crowders that could potentially, sure. you know, maybe or, even make droplets that have three components or, or something. Or nucleic something. acid crowders. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, very interesting. John, so, I'll, I'll next question is some of work that might be interesting for you to think about in that way. Yes, that's a great suggestion. I'll keep you posted. All right. So, next question is by King Shuk Kosh. Hi, John. Uh, Hi. Very nice talk. Hi, nice to see you. Uh, uh, so, I, let me just first make sure I understood one of the graphs correctly. You had a LCST behavior when you have oppositely charged ones, um, RNA yes. and the polymer. So, uh, okay, oh, that's, that's a fantastic question that I completely blew over. You're asking how I got that? Yeah, in the theory uh, or in the film theory, is there a dielectric dependence or temperature? Yes. What's the physics so, in there? So I think what I'll do is I'll send you an email with the details, but basically we had to build in the temperature dependence. So, 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 so th this is a, gr a great point. So there are two different mechanisms that you can have. You can have um, proteins that when you elevate the temperature, droplet formation is prevented. And that's exactly what we saw for the EK peptides. If we raise temperature, they don't like to form droplets. Uh, and so our field theory model captures that perfectly. When we get to tau, experimentally, tau actually favors droplets at high temperature. And what that means is that there's, it's not just an electrostatic effect, which is what our model describes. So what we had to do is go in to, and, and I'll, send, I'll send it to you, but, but we had to go in and based on a parameterized on experiment, we built in a temperature dependence. And I, I can give you the equation. 
Um, that is something, of course, I'm not happy about. Um, and which is why, if I still have my magnificent slides up, we're, we're doing something much better now. And this is what I was hoping to show you, but of course, I'm never, can you see this? Yeah. Yeah, I'm never, never, never as prompt as I hope. So what we're doing now is we're, we're building in an explicit water model, and we're also building in um, hydrophobic residues because that's the only way that we're gonna be able to capture a hydrophobic effect. So what you've noticed correctly is, is a limitation of our current model, which works great for, for anything charged, but not so well when we, then we have to start, you know, tweaking terms in, in not always the most physical way. Yeah, I asked because yesterday I listened to a talk with two oppositely charged polyelectrolyte coacervation. They also saw LCST in experiment and theoretically they had no clue. So, and oh, that's exactly okay. what you're seeing yes. uh, in, the, in this system. You'll have to tell me which, you have to email me that yeah. paper because I know, yeah, we'll talk I, I, I know of unpublished work that also has that behavior. Um, and the way they are rationalizing it is that even though they're both charged, one is more hydrophobic than the other. Yeah. But, but, but yeah, we should talk offline. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so the next uh, question is by Zantosh. Santosh? Santosh, are you still in? Hey, um, sorry. Uh, it was a great talk. Um, I had a question regarding the material properties of uh, this tau uh, droplet. Uh, yeah. So, you know, the material properties of uh, this agriculture Co coacer very depend uh, highly sensitive to the solution condition like the salt or the protein concentration. I was just wondering, is it possible from your simulations to calculate uh, the second virial coefficients uh, um, for this um, tau protein and in turn how do material properties vary with protein concentration or salt or how or other conditions? Um, we haven't looked at that. I guess I guess um, I would have to think about that more um, in terms of material properties. Yeah, so I, I don't. Glasses polyps, or you know, like completely liquid. Uh, you know, I mean, depending upon the intramolecular strength, it can have a spectrum of possibilities. Yeah, we have not looked at that, but that's definitely something uh, something that we we could look at. And um, I mean, I know experimentally there's people have looked at um, material properties, specifically viscosity, and it does yeah. change dramatically um, with, with conditions, but that's something that we haven't really looked at, but certainly something to look at. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, so next question is by Catherine Royer. Okay. Hi, uh, John. Nice that was a wonderful again. talk. <laughs> nice to see you again. Um, so I, I want to go back to first quick question about the muscles. Um, so, you know, they've evolved to, to have the sticky stuff with the DOPA. And I was just curious whether the um, rocks that they stick to are anything like mica. Do they have those rocks, the possibility of making those two hydrogen bonds? Um, and, you know, uh, in situ. Yeah, so actually, you know, we started, uh, the, the reason I first showed you the self-assemble monolayers was because we thought, well, it's a more realistic environment than, than just rock mica because there's slime everywhere. So <laughs> um, I think the reality is, is, is it's more complicated. There may be regions of rock that are exposed or regions that are covered with seaweed. Um, and there's more complex things too with the, the salt-like environment. So I don't know if they've uh, evolved specifically for for rock, but they do seem they do seem to stick to rock. But they also seem, um, yeah, they, they do seem to stick to rock primarily. But they also seem to stick to wood, you know, other other surfaces as well. All so, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Both and that's maybe maybe its ability just to spread out. And I haven't looked at wood at all. Um, 
but it's, it's, I think my catch is the easiest experimental. Sure, which sure. <laughs> go with, which is why I think, and it is, it happens. And, and oh, silica, it also binds to silica, which is glass, which mm -hmm. also gives it the ability to bidentate bond. And, and so that family, you know, the oxides, titanium oxide, mica, silica, it, it all binds to that. Um, but it certainly did not evolve in, in, in nature to stick to titanium oxide, but maybe <laughs> this family, this family of inorganic um, um, entities. I have another question or maybe just a suggestion. So as you know, um, pressure affects uh, liquid liquids phase separation in really interesting ways. And there are definitely organisms that have evolved to um, live at high pressures, especially in the ocean, but elsewhere. Yeah. And they, they cert most certainly have uh, droplets that are doing, you know, this, that, and the other thing in there. And so I was just curious if, uh, if you had been thinking about uh, seeing how pressure and, you know, temperature, adding, adding the other axis to your, your phase diagram. You know what? I had not but now I will. <laughs> no, actually, I had not thought about that. So, I, so they, they, no, I actually did not really know about that. So, yeah, um, Husun, yeah. Chan, Chan, and uh, Chan and uh, Roland Winter have a nice paper showing oh, okay. uh, for model yeah. systems. You know, but it'd be interesting to see also um, systems that are, are natural systems. Uh, you know, what the sequence uh, sort of signatures are for for that Do kind of uh, TMAO and other such things. Yeah, and it would be, you know, there there are uh, increased uh, production of TMAO in some of these circumstances. So it'd be interesting also to add, uh, add that. routers yeah. and, and yeah, awesome Great yeah. suggestion. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, next question is by Anand Srivastava. Anand, please. Uh, can you please go ahead and ask it? I'm, uh, if, if it's okay with you. To, so you would like me to go to a chat? Uh, I, I, I can ask. Uh, I, I can't put on the video. I mean, it's India. I'm already in my pajamas. So. Do you want? Oh, okay. Do you want me to read your question? Uh, I can ask. I can ask it if you don't mind. Not me not sharing the video. Uh, no, no, that's fine. So, so jo, the wonderful talk. Actually, I have followed your papers, uh, recent papers on FTS, quite closely. And I've been trying to work on those models. So, uh, so these when you include these hydrophobic terms, which you have not, uh, unfortunately, like I was looking forward to hear you talk more about it. Do you see the uh, phase transition or the separation happening at a lower density on both sides of the uh, density plot? You know, we don't have converged results yet, so I don't want to say either way. We're just so pleased of something that that <laughs> seemed to work. I, I, I think it's premature for me to, to answer that question at this point. I we're still, see. we're now in like the mass mass running production phase. I and I don't want to say something that it's just an artifact. So, so we, took, we took your model and added, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that I can send you the preprint of that work. Yes, I We miss, added I a hydrophobic, I, hydrophobic term and what mm -hmm. we see and with different kind of decoration. Yes. And we had to we had to really like uh, really think uh, about how to include the hydrophobic term given mm -hmm. the the way the calculations or the complex Langevin calculations are being yes. done. And yes. and what we see is that uh, the the separation starts happening at a much lower density on both sides. Uh, so if you plot the germ length versus the density, mm -hmm. uh, it it. The onset starts happening at a much lower density in these. In no, in I'll, I'll send you the preprint. Maybe it's, it's very is. raw, but but uh, maybe you can give me more insight. Oh, I'd love to. And my other question is: uh, Were you able to see um, what happened at high temperatures? So the temperature thing is a tricky part, and that's why I like the question that uh, was asked to you before this. Mm -hmm. So, what is really the temperature here? I mean. Is the germ length the inverse of germ length you are calling as temperature? Uh, because uh, so so if you if you if you if if I can say that the inverse of the germ length is what is what we call as the temperature, right? So we do mm -hmm. see that. Uh, is that what you mean? Like uh, suppose I I in, I took one by so you have L b by small b, right? As as the y axis, correct? Mm -hmm. Uh, 
if i take the inverse of it uh, we we do see i mean we do not see great change in it, it temperature rises a little bit i mean we see that there is a higher temperature at which the transition is happening but okay. it doesn't flip so, to the lcst kind of it, thing it, it does, doesn't that was my question it, whether it flips yeah. well i would love it to doesn't. see yeah i'd love to talk to you more maybe offline yes sure sure i, I would think, i would I love, love your insight yeah i'll send you my great. i'll send you an email with that uh, draft okay fantastic thank you thanks thanks wonderful talk i learned a lot today <laughs> thank you okay and next question by yuri yupchenko yuri please Yo, you are still muted. You you need to unmute yourself. We don't hear you. Okay, really nice talk. I enjoyed it very much, especially Micah. I am a fan person, and learning about Micah it's really great. But my <laughs> question is different, and this question relates to tau and primarily mm -hmm. tau and other peptides. You mentioned briefly the concentration, but when I look at tau data, it was done in a range of ten. Maybe 100 millimoles. Is it really physiological range of tau? Um, no, no. So these were these were so so these were the in vivo. Uh, no, in sorry, these were not in vivo. They were the in cell conditions um, where it, we had a cell medium. Uh, no, these are high, and this was just to make it happen. Um, the idea is in the cell it would be lower possibly because of all, all the crowding agents that you'd have just a much more concentrated environment. But, but the, the numbers that I showed are, and in simulation is even worse. You know, we, we just go to very high concentrations to make things happen. Um, and that's something to be aware of. Yeah, and this is, uh, even if you're in your simulations, concentration is high. What is the size distribution of these droplets? Uh, maybe size distribution also depends on concentration, or it doesn't much. Um, I'm sure it does. So the, the the best way to answer that would be with these um, the coarse grain models that we're doing. So we're still investigating that. Um, I yeah, we're still investigating that. So we're also looking. Um, you know, these are equilibrium, but if you put non-equilibrium effects, for instance then maybe you could stabilize certain size droplets. Uh, but I don't have a good answer for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, and it looks like the final question is by Ben. Ben, please. Thank you, Joan, uh, really fantastic. It's, I, I love the combination of coarse grain with the field theoretic models I also like your muscle proteins, which are really fantastic systems and, and absolutely curious what these animals can do. I have a very specific question regarding um, something you showed quite in the beginning on your MFB peptide, uh, where you showed the uh, radius of gyration on one axis and the end-to-end -end distance, I suppose, on the other axis. Mm -hmm. And what I found curious is um, that there was a lot of variation in the end-to-end -end distance with very little variation in the radius of gyration. Yes. Um, which it wasn't obvious to me from the sequence how that could happen. Okay, so are you seeing my slide? No. Well, I can tell you, I can tell you two things that happened. The first is that particular data I showed you is from a few years ago. And, now, and, and for that system, we used uh, a force field that we now know has too much secondary structure. So the, the latest simulations have um, one of the, you know, the IDP optimized force fields. Um, so this particular one, and I can't even remember which one we use, maybe an amber, we know is, is, is too compact. So that's probably why. I don't think it really impacts adhesion in the sense that when they come to the surface, the same molecules, can still spot out. We actually redid the simulations with two more modern force fields. Um, and qualitatively, it was all the same thing. But what did change was the protein in isolation just had more ability to be extended. So I think that's probably why 
it looks kind of too balled up. All right. Thanks very much. But, but this bit, uh, but the sequence also doesn't have um, a ton of charge. Are you, wait, what was your question? Your question was why it would be what? Maybe I misunderstood your question. My question was <clears throat> why there would be so little correlation between end-to-end -end distance and radius of gyration. Oh, okay. Um, but if you have secondary structure formation, for instance, then these kinds yeah. of things can happen. I would you. have to go back and I, you know what, I shouldn't even have, sh yeah, I should go back and replace. These are, the, these are the pictures that appeared in a paper that we redid the simulations uh, and I should be replacing these pictures with, with more recent <laughs> ones. I think we just overemphasize secondary structure in that one. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, there are no further questions in the chat. So that means uh, thanks a lot, Joan, for a terrific talk and for great discussion. It was a real pleasure to have you today. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, so um, enjoy your coffee now. <laughs> I will, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thanks everybody for joining and hope to see you in two weeks. Thank you, bye. Thank you, Joan. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.